Hey everybody, welcome back and thank you for joining us as we continue our survey of Hebrews chapter 11. The last couple of weeks we've taken a look at a couple of events from the life of Moses and today we're going to cover an additional event, actually probably a couple. Now Moses is a fascinating character and there's quite a bit of information about him, especially in the book of Exodus. We're not going to be able to cover all of it, but we'll cover some of the highlights. Now in Hebrews 11, the one verse that we're going to be covering today, or at least the general uh, umbrella, if you will, is verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now before we continue with our study today, I do want to uh, commemorate, remember Memorial Day, and wish you a blessed Memorial Day weekend. We've had, of course, countless men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives to secure the freedom that we have in the United States. The very freedom that we're using today to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and his gospel. So before we continue, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study. Father God, we thank you for this day and we do thank you for the freedom that we have in the United States. And we think of the many individuals who have given their lives, who have sacrificed, paid the ultimate price so that we could be free. Lord, help us to not get complacent in our freedom, but recognize that it is an amazing gift that you have given us. And it's a gift that we should use to point people to Christ. Help us to do that, not only in what we say, but in what we do. And be with us today as we study Moses, how he was dealing with a country that was not giving the freedoms that we enjoy today, was not showing those freedoms, was not showing the respect that human beings even deserve. And Lord, help us as we look at Moses' faithfulness to learn lessons from him and learn lessons from where he fell as well. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are. And it's in your son's holy name we pray these things. Amen. So, in Exodus chapter 4, we kind of get a preview of what we'll be talking about today. Verse 30 and 31. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. We don't always hear a lot about the Israelites doing what was right and being obedient, but here's a great passage where Aaron speaks, Moses speaks, the words of the Lord, the people believe, and the response not only is believing, but is to bow their heads and to worship him. So we're going to look at the events that kind of lead up to this point here, and we go back to Exodus chapter 3, which is where we were last week. And just a quick overview, we know that Moses had been exiled for 40 years because he had murdered the Egyptian officer. And so he's actually tending the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. And it's during this time that we have the famous burning bush incident where Moses is called by the Lord. He sees this bush that is inflamed, but it's not consumed. It's not burning up. God speaks to Moses and Moses has the correct response at the end of verse 4, here I am. But we're going to see that maybe the words were right, but his heart wasn't quite right. We continue in verse 9 through 11, where God explains that after 430 years, he is going to free the Israelites from the Egyptian captivity, and that he's called Moses to lead them. And Moses starts coming up with a list of excuses. Last week we saw that he said, well, they're not going to know who I am. And, and so, Lord, tell me, you know, who do I tell them sent me? And God simply says, you tell them that the existing one, the I am, Yahweh, he has sent you. He's your God. He's their God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And put your faith and trust in, in me. But Moses continues, he ramps up the excuse machine here. In fact, we'll see this in verse 1 of the next chapter, chapter 4. Then Moses answered, but... Now, the word but is always a problem if it begins your answer to God. If that's how your answer to God begins, you probably have some problems. So here's what Moses says, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. 
The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that if a similar situation happened with me, if I had a stick, I throw it to the ground, it turns into a snake, I'm going to run in the opposite direction of the snake. So this is a perfectly understandable human reaction. And then verse 4, But the Lord said to Moses, Put your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Now this is pretty fascinating to me because Moses' first reaction <clears throat> excuse me is to run away from the snake makes perfect sense right and then god says yeah grab it by the tail <laughs> and moses obeys which is pretty amazing i don't know that i would have that same response i remember growing up in seattle and we lived across the street from uh, a vacant lot and it was overrun with blackberries blackberry bushes everywhere in fact my brother and i would go through the blackberries and we'd pick and eat the blackberries. There were tunnels, there were uh, some, somebody had made a fort inside there, but you would run into an occasional garter snake. And I remember one had made its way across the street over to our front yard. And the neighbor lady who had been born in the country of Greece, she didn't like snakes, shot, thought they were evil. And so she ran, grabbed a shovel and hacked it into uh, multiple pieces. Um, so the snake was taken care of. Even though it wasn't a venomous snake, she got rid of it. And so we can kind of see, uh, if I were Moses, uh, I might have been, well, he didn't have a shovel maybe, but I might have had a similar reaction. But he picks the thing up, and God says, all right, um, here's why I'm going to do this, that they, the Israelites, may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And now again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So two amazing miracles. And one, we see God having command over his creation. And I think it's a reminder to Moses. It's like, hey, this stick I created, I'm going to turn it into a snake, which I created. And then I'm going to turn it back into the original stick, this staff. So I have power over creation, Moses. And you're going to use this staff to symbolize my power. But Moses needed another lesson. And so now God shows him something more profound and powerful. We get a really important clue here at the end of verse 6 when it says his hand was leprous like snow. Some translations say that his hand was white. And leprosy is one of those diseases that as it progresses and when it gets really, really bad, the skin can actually appear white. Even the hair will turn white. And so when Moses sees that his hand is white, he's got to be thinking, well, that's it. I'm dead. God has struck me with leprosy. He knew that he was that this whiteness symbolized the latter represented the latter stages of the disease and that it was terminal and there was no there was no hope. And yet God performs a healing. God it wasn't just a symbol that he had. I believe God actually gave Moses leprosy. And we see that later on, remember with his sister Miriam. Um and then he tells Moses, okay, put your hand back in your cloak. I have a feeling Moses responded far more quickly with that than he did with the snake part. But uh, in any event, God heals him miraculously. And so not only had God showed him that he had power over his creation, here he shows him, he reminds Moses, I have power over life. Your very life is in my hands. So Moses, you need to trust me. And the children of Israel need to trust me. And in verse 8, God continues and he says, If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. And if they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Verse 10, But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past 
or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So God has given him these amazing miracles, and he still has some doubts. He's still making excuses. And in verse 13, one of the most damning things that Moses says, he says, but he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> now, God has already said, you're the one I've picked. I'm going to give you the power to do it. I'm going to give you the words. You don't have to worry about these things. And it says in verse 14, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Now, the idea of kindled is, well, just what it sounds like. He was inflamed. His anger was, was heated. And so, verse 14 it's not that God was ready to strike him dead. It's that <clears throat> God had had enough and was saying, look, I, you don't need more evidence. Um, and I've already told you that I'm going to take care of things. But God in his patience and his long suffering continues and says, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Well, of course, God knew he could speak well because God had created Aaron with the ability to speak. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will, be, he will be glad in his heart. Now, keep in mind what's partly what's going on through, or going on in Moses' head. When he hears that Aaron is going to come, and God says he's going to be glad to see you, well, of course he is. It's been 40 years that these brothers haven't seen each other, and they were three years apart. And so, um, God is still showing Moses compassion and love, even though he's at a point where it's like, Moses, you just, you need to trust me. Stop with the excuses. Uh, I've got you covered. So God continues and said, you shall speak to him, to Aaron, and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. Now, obviously, when God says that you'll be like God to Aaron, he's not saying God is in the sense of a God, little g, but the idea that the very words, Moses, that you're going to speak are going to be my words. So you will speak my words to Aaron. Aaron will speak my words to the people. And in verse 17, God says, And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. So just another reminder. I have control of your life, I have control of your mouth, and I control my creation. So grab the stick and get going. So in verse 18, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now this is kind of an interesting side note here because... We don't get the idea. Now, keep in mind, this is Moses that is writing this. This is the account that God has given Moses to share. But this is from Moses' perspective. And he's, he's doing something that shows integrity because he's indebted to Jethro. He's been in service to Jethro. And to show a sign of respect, he asks Jethro permission to leave. And to Jethro's credit, he says, go in peace. He kind of gives Moses a blessing. And we don't see that Jethro asks a bunch of questions, and we don't see that Moses gave him a lot of information. It doesn't appear that Moses lets Jethro know exactly what his plans are, or more specifically, what God's plans are. But in any event, Moses leaves, and it says in verse 20, So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. I like the fact that Moses inserts this little bit of information, because the staff has been mentioned, obviously, a couple of times, and this time Moses points out that it's the staff of God. It's not just any piece of wood. This is a staff that God has, you could almost say, anointed, in that God has a purpose even for this hunk of wood. Not that the wood's going to do anything, but it's going to symbolize who God is and that like a great shepherd, he's going to lead his people. Verse 21, And the Lord said to Moses, 
when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So we kind of see God having Moses go through a dress rehearsal of sorts in that with the staff turning into a snake and the hand turning, you know, coming uh, up with leprosy um, and, and even mentioning something that's going to happen is the tenth plague. We see kind of uh, God saying, look, I'm, I'm going to show you these things because you're going to be doing these things. These things are going to happen. That makes sense. It made sense in my head. So now we continue on to one of the stranger passages in Scripture and one that sometimes maybe is uncomfortable. Um, little PG-13 here, but is Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. So it's just three verses. We don't get a lot of detail, but what we do get... Well, we'll talk about it. So verse 24, At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Okay, well that seems a little abrupt and a little bit out of left field. So a couple of things to note on that first verse. When it says at a lodging place, some translation, well, I believe King James uh, uses the word in, I-N-N. And it's the same problem that we run into with the so-called Christmas story when it says, you know, that Mary and Joseph went to an inn. Well, it's not inn as in a, a hotel or, or even a residence necessarily. And in this particular instance, in verse 24, in the Hebrew, it's just talking about a place that they stopped to take a break. So wherever it was, it wasn't necessarily in a town or village or city or anything like that. It's just they took a, they took a break. And it's here that it says the Lord met him. And so some uh, commentaries believe that this is another uh, another appearance of the Son of God, another Christophany, if you will, pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God, and that it's a visible manifestation uh, of the second member of the Trinity. And it's because of that word met. It wasn't that the Lord showed him or spoke to him. It's that the Lord met him. And maybe it was like when Balaam saw the, well, Balaam's donkey saw the angel with the flaming sword. Maybe it was something like that. We're not sure. But in any event, the message to Moses, if he spoke at all, is to, where it says, sought to put him to death. Well, what it really means is he became gravely ill. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a fascinating passage. And I read 12 or so commentaries, believe it or not, and none of them are in complete agreement as to exactly what is going on here. But the general consensus seems to be that Moses was struck with some illness, and we're not sure what it was, but had the Lord not intervened, he would have died. So this is the second time in not a long period of time that Moses is, is really going to die unless the Lord intervenes. Then in verse 25 it says, Then Zipporah, his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So it's a bit of a head-scratcher here, but what we can discern from verses 25 and 26 is that Moses had not done what he was supposed to do. And their newborn son, the second son, um, had not been circumcised. And maybe Moses had a good reason. Maybe he wanted to wait until they got to Egypt, didn't want to do it while they were traveling, needed to leave. I, I don't know. Maybe he justified it's like, well, the Lord said we need to go to Egypt and we don't have time to deal with the circumcision. Uh, I have a feeling that Zipporah had an influence because the Midianites did not practice circumcision. Even though they were descendants of Abraham, it wasn't one of the, the rituals, one of the rites that they, that they exercised, that they practiced. And so, um, it sounds like maybe Moses, in his weakness, didn't take the lead that he was supposed to. 
and didn't take the Lord's command seriously that he was supposed to have his son circumcised. And apparently the older son, the first son, was circumcised because uh, in verse 25 when it says, Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin. Um, the son, the word son there is, is referring to a singular individual, not plural. Um, and so it's the second son that has not been circumcised. And so he's more than eight days old because they were supposed to be circumcised by on, not by, on day eight. God was very specific about, the, about him, about that. So Zipporah really, to save her husband more than obedience to God, um, realizes what needs to be done and probably at the pleading of Moses. Now some have asked, well, why didn't Moses take care of the circumcision? He's the one who should have taken care of it. Well, Moses didn't take care of it because he couldn't. Physically, he wasn't able to do it. He was weak and seriously ill, so he didn't have the strength to do it. So Zipporah does it and basically says, you know what, you're you're disgusting, you're a bloodthirsty individual, I find this repugnant, um, but she does it. So it's, a, it's an odd passage, but an interesting one. Now, where does Moses get this information, and what was he disobeying? Well, here's what he was disobeying in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. God's very clear, and he tells Abraham exactly what circumcision was, and what it was supposed to, how, how, when it was supposed to happen. So let's go ahead and read that passage. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner, foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So we can see by that last part, God takes this very seriously. And God takes all of his commands seriously. And we don't get to pick and choose. I like to do the cafeteria Christianity thing or the buffet believer type of thing where I, I pick and choose the things that I like. And, uh, but God says, no, you don't get to pick and choose which of my commands you obey. Be men, be women of integrity, because you're my children, and I expect nothing less. Now, as we take a look at that passage, uh, we notice, well, I notice that there are several words that pop up frequently. And so we're going to go back to verse 9, and we see that the word covenant, the word offspring, the word circumcision... Those appear pretty frequently. Now, some of you may be familiar with the inductive Bible study method, and it's a great way to kind of see what the theme is of a verse, who's, who's speaking, who's the recipient, you know, who's the audience of this verse, kind of answering the, the who, what, when, why, where, where, or how, all of those questions. Um, and so we're going to just do a little bit of that today and just so that it gives us an idea of what God sees as being important and the theme of what he's, the message of what he's trying to get across here. So when we look at the word covenant, um, we can see that it shows up a couple of times in these three verses, and the word circumcised also shows up a couple of times here, and we'll also see that the word offspring shows up. And so I just put those little graphics, I hope they show up on there and you can see them, but but we see that uh, each of those verses shows up two times in these three verses. By the way, I'm not hinting at all that there's some connection with them all showing up twice. It just happens to be where, where we broke the verses off here. And when we continue to the next uh, section, we see that the word covenant, the word circumcised, the word, word offspring, they all show up once again. And in the last couple of verses here, we see that the word covenant shows up three times, circumcised twice, uncircumcised shows up as well. 
And so it's, God doesn't stutter. <laughs> And language does matter in Scripture, and so God is putting an emphasis on the covenant, the fact that it is to be a symbol to the offspring, to future generations, and that symbol is circumcision. Now, who's saying this? Well, obviously God. It's a command, and so that's why we need to take it seriously. That's why there is some weight to it. It's not just somebody's su suggestion. This is a command. This is a directive from God. And so we can see that God and pronouns referring to him are referenced a few times here. And then Abraham and the pronouns referencing him and his offspring. But yeah, so who's the audience? Abraham and future generations. Who's the author of this? God is. And we see that continue in the next couple of passages. Um, and we see that uh, yeah, in the next couple of verses. So based on all that, we can get an idea of what God's message is. That God made a covenant with Abraham and his offspring, and it's symbolized by circumcision. So if God spends this much time explaining a command, it's surely important, and surely Moses should have uh, obeyed it. And I should stop saying surely because there's a certain movie that's popping into my mind and some of you know what I'm talking about and others of you just aren't as culturally, sophistic as culturally sophisticated as others of us. Continue on in verse 27 of chapter 4. And so we have that circumcision story with Zipporah and with Moses and then it kind of goes back to uh, the events at hand. So the Lord said to Aaron, now how cool is this? God makes an appearance to Aaron, or rather he speaks to Aaron, and says, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And we can imagine what Moses, excuse me, what Abraham is thinking, that he gets to see his brother. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. What an amazing family reunion this must have been after 40 years. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. In those last two verses we read at the beginning of our message today. And it's really just an, a, a beautiful picture of faith. Aaron trusted the words of the Lord that Moses has shared with him. And Moses shows him, you know, everything that God had shown him. And these miracles are performed to show the elders that indeed God is who he said he is and that he's going to fulfill his promise. It's almost like God had predicted that. Huh. So then we go into chapter 5 and we see that afterward Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. So Pharaoh doesn't receive this well. Huh. Yeah, God predicted that too, didn't he? And this should have built the faith of Moses, for sure, and Aaron as well. And yet we still see that they, they still struggle with it from time to time, even though this is playing out exactly as God had told them. But Pharaoh says, look, hey, if, if your people, if the Israelites have time to offer sacrifices to their God, then they're just messing around and they need to get back to work, you know? They, if they've got time to do that, they've got time to make more bricks. Continuing in verse 5, And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens? 
The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it, and pay no regard to lying words. So Pharaoh's response is predictable, well, because God said that he was going to, well, refuse to let them go. And, uh, you know, he didn't respect the Lord, and so he certainly wasn't going to respect the Lord's people. Continuing in verse 10, So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you done, not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. So things went from bad to worse, and the foremen are upset about it. You can understand why they're upset about it. And so now they have gone to Moses and Aaron in verse 20. They met with Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Kind of an interesting phrase there. You have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh. So Moses and Aaron, it's your fault. You had to go and speak up and demand that he let us go, and now things are even worse. Well, it doesn't stop there, unfortunately. The griping spreads to Moses. And in verse 22, Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Wow, I mean, this is bold and stupid at the same time. And yet I find myself saying bold and stupid things to the Lord from time to time as well. We can understand Moses' frustration, and he does care about his people, but he's not trusting in God. God told him that this is what was going to happen, and he's not seeing beyond the present. He's not seeing that God has already written the future. God already has uh, something better planned for them. And it's easy to see why he's discouraged. Um, so then we see, continuing in chapter 6, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. It's like, all right, Moses, I asked you to trust me. I told you what I was going to do. You've grumbled. And uh, you're going you're gonna to see what's going to happen now. I will keep my promise, because I always do. Now, every nation struggles with trusting God, or every, at least our nation has struggled with trusting God. I guess not every nation, because not every nation was founded on biblical principles. We certainly were founded on biblical principles, principles but we have wandered quite a ways from them. But you know, we can come back. And this is a verse that we think of often when it comes to uh, our nation and, and its current state. First Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And so we see that God 
he is a forgiving God and he will heal the land. He and is healing it spiritually and bringing it back to a point where it's a nation that serves the Lord. But notice his, his prerequisites here. First, we need to humble ourselves and we need to pray, talk to him. And while we're doing that, when we're doing that, seek his face, his guidance, what he wants for us, his will and turn from our wicked ways. So there's repentance that is necessary for there to be revival. And God says that he will do it if those things are happening. And unfortunately, I think in some ways, even the church in the United States is not doing these things. We talk a lot about loving Jesus and doing Jesus things and come up with cute new ways of describing Jesus-y stuff. But are we truly repentant? Are we changing direction? Or are we becoming more and more like the culture that is around us? Note verse 13, the context, what comes before this. The Lord says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. Maybe God has sent pestilence. I don't know. People have asked me, do I think that this pandemic is judgment from God? It might be. Um, is it judgment for the unbeliever? Well, no. In fact, it would be judgment for us, discipline for us. God disciplines those whom he loves. And God does love the believers that are in the United States and throughout the world. Now, whether this is God's direct discipline or not, he has allowed it to happen. And he does have a purpose in it. Our job is to figure out what that purpose is and to turn from our wickedness. And revival has to start with us as individuals. If Israel had any hope of getting back on track, it had to start with the individual. And we see that throughout their history. There's a pattern of them crying out to the Lord for forgiveness and God answers them. And in his answer though for deliverance is sometimes pretty harsh. Even in this situation where they're rescued from Egypt after 430 years, they still um, you know, have to go through a lot of struggle and 40 years of wandering around, wandering around in the wilderness. So is there hope for Israel? Well, yeah, we can see it throughout scripture. Is there hope for us as a country? Absolutely. So what can we learn from this passage? Well, first of all, that faith in God will lead to obedience. If we truly trust God, then it means we'll obey him. It's not just, you know, when Moses said, well, here I am, Lord. That's great. Those are the right words. But did he have the right heart? He still had excuses. He still had doubts. He still was flat out disobedience. We saw that in his lack of following through on circumcising his second son. Secondly, God keeps his promises always. God keeps the good promises, those promises of the amazing things that he will do for us, the blessings that he will shower upon us. He also keeps his promises when it comes to discipline. He will not be mocked, and God will follow through on disciplining us and disciplining the evil that is around us. And lastly, national forgiveness begins with individual repentance. As I said before, if there's any hope for us as a nation, it starts with us. It starts with you, it starts with me. And if we can't get our act together, if we're not men and women of integrity, then there's really no hope left for our nation. With that, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you again for who you are and for blessing this nation and for blessing our church and for blessing faithful believers around the country, around the world. I pray that you would strengthen us during these difficult times, Lord, that we would not have a spirit of fear, that we would not give in to fear, that we would be wise, that we would be smart, that we would show discernment, and Lord, in the midst of it, that we would point people to Christ. Help us to search our own hearts, our own thoughts, and see where we need to repent, where we need to change. As the psalmist says at the end of Psalm 139, you, we, we want you to search us and we want you to test the thoughts that we have and you already know what we think. And so as, as the psalm ends, lead us in the way everlasting. God, thank you for always being a God that we can trust, a God of your word. Moses and the children of Israel were able to trust you and we can as well. 
God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day and have a great Memorial Day.